Hello and welcome to St Clement's Mossman. My name is Andy, one of the ministers here, and it's great to have you watching this short service. These short services follow on from our live stream services that we did during the time of the coronavirus lockdown in Australia. Thankfully at St Clement's we can now meet together in person again, but we still wanted to provide an online service for you. So that's what this is, a short service with a song or a hymn, a Bible reading, a Bible talk, and then a song or hymn at the end. We hope that it's of use for you. You might be a regular member of St Clement's and unable to come at this time. You might be local and you're checking us out online. We'd love to see you in person at one of our services soon. Or maybe you're from further afield. Well, whoever you are and wherever you are, welcome. We'd love to hear from you in the comments down below and uh, hear from who you are and maybe where you are as well and if you've got any questions. But we're doing this because we want you to know Jesus and to love Jesus. We hope this helps you in that. Thanks for watching. The next reading is from 1 Corinthians 10, starting at verse 23. Now, Andy advises me that it's probably not going to come on screen. It is in your handout if you wish to follow it on paper. So I'll give you a second, just look for that. Right. All things are lawful, but not all things are beneficial. All things are lawful, but not all things build up. Do not speak, seek your own advantage, but that of the other. 
eat whatever is sold in the meat market without raising any question on the ground of conscience, for the earth and its fullness are the Lord's. If an, if an unbeliever invites you to a meal and you are disposed to go, eat whatever is set before you without raising any question on the ground of conscience. But if someone says to you, this has been offered in sacrifice, then do not eat it out of consideration for the one who informed you and for the sake of conscience. I'm in the other's conscience, not your own, for why should my liberty be subject to the judgment of someone else's conscience? If I, put, if I partake with thankfulness, why should I be denounced because of that for which I give thanks? So, whether you eat or drink, or whether you do, whatever you do, do everything for the glory of God. Give no offence to Jews, to Greeks, or to the Church of God. Just as I try to please everyone in everything I do, not seeking my own advantage, but that of many, so that they may be saved. Be imitators of me, as I am of Christ. Well, I do have that uh, sheet uh, that uh, you had for that Bible reading out, and uh, keep that in front of you as uh, we go through uh, this afternoon. Uh, but it'd be good to pray as we begin. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have given us your word. Thank you for this letter that Paul wrote to the church in Corinth. Now, that isn't just a historic letter. But because your word is living and active and sharper than any double-edged sword, it speaks today. And so we ask and pray that you'd speak to us today. And Father, please help us to listen, not just to hear your word, but please help us to be doers of your word. And we ask this for your glory. Amen. Now, there we go. For the glory. Uh, now, this is uh, Eric Liddell. Um, I expect many of you know who he is. Uh, he was an Olympic runner and uh, ran in the Paris 1924 Olympics. And I've mentioned him before, uh, but I hadn't come across this uh, biography uh, about him um, until this week. I haven't uh, read it, I must confess. Uh, but this is what uh, Duncan Hamilton, who I think uh, is a secular kind of sports author, uh, says. He says, Eric Liddell was as close to a saint as any man in modern history has been, renowned for his athletic prowess. It was also his deeply entrenched values that set him apart from the crowd. These qualities were never better illustrated than the 1924 Paris Olympics when having declined his place in the 100 metres, owing to the fact that the race was to be run on a Sunday, he produced an astonishing performance to win gold in the 400 metres and captured the hearts of the world. See, Duncan says that Eric Little, in those 1924 Olympics, captured the hearts of the world. And Eric Little, at that moment, had a choice to make. Whose glory was he going to live for? Would he live for his own glory, for the glory of Eric Little? Or would he keep living for the glory of God? He was a, a Christian. That's why he chose, in his conscience, not to run on the Sunday. Would he live for the glory of God? Not just in the 1924 Olympics, but every day. Well, it's like that for the Corinthians. They had a choice to make. Would they live for their glory or would they live for the glory of God, as Paul writes to them here? You think that, I think that's one of the big problems that's going on in Corinth, that their egos are overinflated. And in some ways, they're living for their glory. And Paul's challenge to them, we see tonight, is to live for the glory of God. But it's a challenge also for us here tonight. We have a choice to make. Will we live, will you live, will I live for your glory, for my glory, or will we live for the glory of God? You see, Paul's written, as David just read for us before our Bible readings, and as we had in that reading, 
Paul's punchline here to what he's writing in the letter at this point. He says, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do everything for the glory of God. And that's what we're going to be looking at tonight as we look at this part of 1 Corinthians. But what does it look like to do everything for the glory of God? Well, Paul gets very practical as he shows us two interrelated answers to this question of what does it look like to live for the glory of God? And it's actually two interrelated answers that were on Jesus' lips that we say every week at our eight o'clock prayer book service. And I'm going to read you just a little bit of the introduction that we have each week at eight o'clock. This is what we say. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. This is the great and the first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. And they're the two interrelated answers on the lips of Jesus to this question of how we're to glorify God. We're to love God with everything we have, and we're to love our neighbor as ourself. So let's look at these two first of all. First of all, let's look, here we go, at loving God. Paul says you should love God. And now we didn't uh, have this uh, read as part of our reading. It was a little bit long, the whole passage. So come back with me to that sheet, uh, to verse 14 of chapter 10 where Paul is kind of summing up from where we were last week and springboarding in to where we'll see this week. Verse 14, Paul says, Therefore, my dear friends, flee from the worship of idols. I speak as to sensible people. Judge for yourselves what I say. The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a sharing in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a sharing in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. Consider the people of Israel. Are not those who eat the sacrifices partners in the altar? What do I imply then? That food sacrificed to idols is anything or that an idol is anything? No, I imply that what pagans sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. I do not want you to be partners with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake in the table of the Lord and the table of demons. Or are we provoking the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? See, Paul is basically saying here in a nutshell, you can't two-time God. You can't have a relationship with God and then a relationship with with another, which Paul will show us is having a relationship with demons. We'll we'll come to that. See, firstly, Paul says for these Christians in Corinth, you are in a covenantal relationship with Jesus Christ. Have a look with me again at verse 16. This is uh, pictured in the Lord's Supper that Paul is talking about here. This meal the bread and the wine, to remember what Jesus has done for us in his death on the cross and how he's brought us to himself in this covenantal fellowship. Verse 16, the cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a sharing in the blood of Christ? And the bread that we break, is it not a sharing in the body of Christ? That, that sharing word is a, is a strong word. It's this idea of you're in a covenant fellowship with that person. That's what the bread and the wine is signifying, signifying our relationship with Jesus Christ. Paul has talked about this right at the start of his letter. Chapter 1, verse 9, he says this, that by him, that is by God, you, Corinthian Christians, were called into the fellowship. It's the same word that was translated sharing in our passage of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. We're in this relationship with Jesus Christ. But the issue 
in the Corinthian church is that some of the Corinthian Christians seem to think that they could stay in their old pagan lifestyle and have this relationship with Jesus. And in particular, in relation to sacrifices in the temples to idols. You see, they thought they could stay in the Corinthian culture and keep up with all their friends as they would go to the temple of say, Aphrodite for a pagan feast to this idol. You see, at that time, the temple, if you like, was the restaurant if you wanted to eat out. You would go to the dining room of the temple and have a pagan feast there where the food would be offered to the idol and things would be said and rights would be gone through. But Paul shows them this is wrong. And again, Paul takes them, like we saw last week, back to the failings of Israel in the past. That's what's going on in verse 18. Where Paul reminds them again and says, look, consider the people of Israel. Or actually, if you go down to the footnote, which is often a very helpful thing to do if you've got footnotes in your Bibles. It's more literally, actually, the Greek. That's what the GK says. The Greek is Israel according to the flesh. So he's saying to them, look, consider Israel according to the flesh. That is sinful Israel, just like we saw last week back in the Old Testament, where they had been unfaithful to God. Consider unfaithful Israel. Are not those unfaithful Israel in the Old Testament who eat the sacrifices, and this is pagan sacrifices, partners in the altar to those false gods? See, he's saying that Israel's sacrifices to idols link them to that idol. Not that an idol is anything, Paul says in verse 19. An idol isn't anything, or the food sacrifice to the idol isn't anything. But actually, there's a far dangerous thing going on behind. There's a demonic reality behind pagan sacrifices. So the idol isn't anything. But verse 20, here is what Paul is saying. I imply that what pagans sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. Here is the reality behind pagan sacrifices. They are of the devil. And Paul is linking back again to the Old Testament and to Israel in the past. And you can look at it later on in your own time in Deuteronomy chapter 32, about halfway through. And Paul talks about how Israel's idolatry then was sacrificing to demons. Seems to be that passage is forming a, a backdrop for Paul here as he talks to the church in Corinth who had this very real issue of food being sacrificed to idols. And so Paul's conclusion is very strong, isn't it? Verse 21, you cannot have your feet in both camps, basically. Look, you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. See, if you are, you're going to be provoking the Lord to jealousy. Again, a word back in Deuteronomy 32. Are we stronger than he? That is, are we stronger than the Lord thinking that we can do this? We will not withstand him and his anger if we're trying to have our feet in both camps, just as we saw last week. And the warning to the Corinthians of Israel's past. Paul says, love God and love him only. It's much along the lines of what Jesus said. Back in the Gospels, in Luke chapter 16, Jesus said this, No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money isn't it? You cannot have two masters. You can't have your feet in both camps. And glorifying God means serving only him. It means, oops, sorry, I thought we had that up on the screen. Can you go to the next slide, Sam? It seems to have all gone crazy down here. Glorifying God means loving him with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. 
Eric Little could so easily have run for his glory, couldn't he? And lived for his own glory, but he chose not to. He chose to run for the glory of God. And then after the Olympics, he chose to make a decision to uh, run. Sorry, it's all. Do you want to go to that next slide, Sam? Thank you. Yeah. Um, So he chose to run for the glory of God. But then after the Olympics, he chose to go to China to be a missionary for the glory of God and tell people there about the good news of Jesus. He left a promising career in running, if there was such a thing in those days, behind. And the glory of that to become a missionary in China. That was how he loved God. See, the Lord Jesus had Eric's heart. Does he have yours? Or are you provoking the Lord Jesus to jealousy? See, we're not literally taking part in pagan feasts, are we? That's not uh, where idols are in our culture. But what is it that takes your time, your love, your money, your devotion? So that the Lord Jesus doesn't have all of your love, all of your heart. What are the idols for you? Might be financial security. It might be family security. Maybe it's rituals that have come in and taken you away from devotion to the Lord Jesus. Maybe a weekend ritual that is beginning to start to take you away from gathering with God's people. Or a daily ritual that is taking you away from time with God in his word and prayer. How easy it is, isn't it, to check out the news when we've got that idle moment, particularly at this time, rather than keeping on checking out what God says and checking in with him in prayer. Paul says idolatry is serious. And so he says to flee from it, doesn't he, at the start of our passage Flee from idolatry. So that's the first part of doing everything for the glory of God. It is to love him and partner only with him and love him exclusively and exhaustively with all that we are. And the second part of glorifying God is to love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, The keen ones looking at the screen will spot that uh, that is an American picture uh, with their spelling of neighbor there. Uh, But I thought that was quite a fun one. But that's what Paul says as he goes on from verse 23 onwards. He says, love your neighbor. Let me read verses 23 and 24 again. Uh, This is a kind of Corinthian slogan. All things are lawful, so what they think. And then Paul responds, but not all things are beneficial. All things are lawful. But not all things build up. Do not seek your own advantage, but that of the other. That's Paul's principle here, which is love your neighbor, isn't it? Do not seek your own advantage, but that of the other. Now we've seen this before, haven't we? As we've gone through Corinthians. And now Paul illustrates this principle, again, on this idea of meat and whether, where it's been sacrificed and where you're eating it and all that kind of stuff. Have a look with me at verse 25 and 26. Paul says, eat whatever is sold in the meat market without raising any question on the ground of conscience. For the earth and its fullness are the Lord's. See, Paul says you're free to go to the butcher in the marketplace. And to buy the meat there and eat it. Yes, it will probably most likely have been sacrificed to an idol. But you're not taking part in the ritual when you're just eating that meat. And in fact, theologically, Paul takes us to Psalm 24 and Psalm 24 verse 1. As we read before, he says, The earth and its fullness, all that the earth produces, are the Lord's. And so eat them. So you can eat meat from the marketplace, that's okay. Just don't eat it in the temple. Don't partake in those demonic rituals. 
in the temple, but you can eat the meat, that's okay. You can even, verse 27, go and enjoy a barbie with your friends, with your non-Christian friends when they invite you over, and eat the meat, that's okay. Have a look at verse 27. If an unbeliever invites you to a meal and you are disposed to go, eat whatever is set before you without raising any question on the ground of conscience. But now Paul inserts a little conundrum which goes to this principle of not seeking your own advantage. Have a look at verse 28. Here's the issue. But what if someone says to you, and it's thought that this might actually be another Christian, a Christian who, um, as Paul has described them earlier in chapter 8 on this issue of food, is, is weaker and isn't quite at this same point of seeing all food as okay to eat, even that that's been sacrificed to an idol. If, uh, if someone says to you, this has been offered in sacrifice, they're making a point about it as you're there at this barbecue, then do not eat it out of consideration for the one who informed you and for the sake of conscience. I mean the other's conscience, not your own. Do you see what's happening there? Someone else, perhaps from church, is there with you at the barbecue with these non-Christian friends. And they say, hey, hasn't this been offered in sacrifice? And up until that point, it's okay. But because they're concerned about that, Paul says, well, be concerned about them. And so don't eat that meat. And Paul kind of comes back to his, uh, after this interjection of this potential issue, halfway through verse 29, he says, for why should my liberty be subject to the judgment of someone else's conscience? It's okay, you are free to eat unless there's this issue that would hurt another Christian. Verse 30, if I partake, that is in eating meat with thankfulness, why should I be denounced because of that for which I give thanks? So it is okay to eat meat, but there's this caveat around that. If it's going to cause another Christian to stumble, if it's not going to build them up, if it's not going to be to their advantage, then don't eat it. See, Eric Little, coming back to him, didn't seek his own advantage. Uh, later on in his uh, ministry in China, um, the Japanese uh, were invading and uh, he uh, sent his wife and three daughters uh, off uh, to Canada in 1941, but he remained in China under the watchful eye of the Japanese authorities. And in 1943, uh, he was sent to an internment camp where he lived out the final two years of his life. He died there of a brain tumour just months before the end of the war. And during that time in the camp, there are many accounts of how little lived, glorifying God because he loved his neighbor, because he sought their advantage. Here's one from an American who became a, a theologian there called Langdon Gilkey. And he said this of little. Often in an evening, I would see him bent over a chessboard or a model boat or directing some sort of square dance, absorbed, weary, and interested, pouring all of himself into this effort to capture the imagination of these penned up youths. He was overflowing with good humour and love for life, with enthusiasm and chance. It's rare indeed that a person has the good fortune to meet a saint, but he came as close to it as anyone I have ever known. And indeed, he is a saint. He was a Christian following the Lord Jesus, bringing him glory which is why he poured himself into those youths there in the camp to help them and also to teach them the good news about Jesus. Now, there are other stories of how he gave away his meager food rations to others who needed it. Now, there's even a story, which I think is true, of how uh, it was arranged um, through Churchill that he was going to be set free from the camp. And actually, rather than him being set free, he sought the advantage of another, a pregnant woman, to be set free rather than him. And he died in that camp. He lived, obviously not perfectly, seeking the advantage of the other. 
It's such a challenge, isn't it, to live our lives like this. Not to seek our own advantage, but that of the other. It's costly. It might be tiring. But it builds up the church. And it brings glory to God. You see, we've got to remember the primary context of 1 Corinthians is the church. And our relationships. And Paul says, in your relationships in the church, yes, obviously spilling out from that as well. Don't seek your own advantage, but that of the other. That's how we glorify God. So what is it that you need to do or say or not do or not say for someone else at church to seek their welfare rather than your own? And what is it you could do for someone in your Bible study group to seek their welfare that'll cost you to do that in whatever way it might be in time or whatever it is? How can we seek the welfare of others? Paul says that's the second way we glorify God. The first way we love God. The second way we love others. And here's his conclusion. Let me read these verses from verse 31 again. So, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do everything for the glory of God. Give no offence to others, whether it be Jews or Greeks outside the church, non-Christians, or to the church of God, those inside. Give no offence to anyone. Just as I try to please everyone in everything I do, not seeking my own advantage, here's the principle that Paul applies to himself, but that of many, so that they may be saved. Be imitators of of me, Paul says, as I am of Christ. What a challenge, as Paul sums up here. And of course, we all fail and miss the mark in this, don't we? Just as Paul did as well. But there is one who didn't fail to glorify God, who loved his heavenly Father perfectly and loved others perfectly. It's the Son of God, isn't it? Our Lord Jesus Christ. He did absolutely everything for the glory of God. And supremely, he gave his life for the glory of God and for our advantage. That we might be set free from our sins and our failure to glorify God. And he rose again, conquering the death that should be ours. And will bring us again through death to be before our Heavenly Father. He did all that for us so that we can share in his glory. Let us, whatever we do, do everything for the glory of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness to us. Lord, we thank you that you have sought our advantage in sending your son to us and sending your son to die for us that we might be brought into your family. Father, thank you for that. Thank you for your son, the Lord Jesus, who sought our advantage through his death that we might be set free from our sin. And so, Father, we pray that as we live now as your people, you would work in us by your Holy Spirit to help us in whatever we do, glorify you. Amen.
Estou 